Get ready to move the conversation forward. This ain't your granddad's news and comment show. This is I Doubt It Podcast with Brittany Page and Jesse Dallimore. Welcome to the show, episode 910, if you can believe it. I'm your host, Jesse Dollimore. Joined today, all of us are here, the lovely, talented, and scholarly Brittany Page. <laughs> That's me. And my other co-host on a completely separate podcast that you're going to learn about right now, Ian Brinksman. Hello, returning champion Ian Brinksman. I think you you forgot to mention that. Friend of the show. I don't, I don't see my challenge coin. I assume that's in the mail. <laughs> Challenge coin mm-hmm. and returning champion. Thank you. Alternatively, the enemy. The, well, if if we're from my perspective, for, yeah, that's that's the fair. competition. The yeah, enemy. Yeah, yeah, the... After ten years, for some reason, he needs a new co-host. Not sure what's happening here. Look, th- there's enough of Jesse D to share. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I am legitimately happy for both of you. Sounds you're, like it. you're starting this wonderful podcast. The John Adams podcast. The what? The John, uh, the, uh, 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 I can't even say it. I feel so betrayed. The <laughs> <laughs> the John Adams, a revolutionary review. Mm. I yeah. think that you guys have a better theme song than this show, by the way. we I don't have it queued up to play, but so the not the other night. It was in January sometime. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How did it come about? Yeah. We, we were all at dinner, having a lovely dinner with some lovely drinks. And Ian made an offhand comment about the show or something. Yeah, that I just watched it and it, I, it, you know, just out of nowhere. I think we were talking about history. And I think that's, and you, yeah. your eyes got bright. Brittany's got a little, you know, dim. Uh, she, she went of, like that, this. That to, was the face. She went like this to the, to the wait staff, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Another drink yep, over here. Yep. Well, first of all, I mean, shouldn't you say that the podcast is based on the HBO series yes. John well, Adams? Well, you had the opportunity when you misnamed the show. It's HBO's John Adams, a revolutionary <laughs> review. Listen, it's not my show. I don't need to promote it. I don't need That's to. That's true. Actually, if anything, you need to sabotage it. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we were talking about history, and then I was like, oh, yeah, by the way, I just started rewatching the uh, the John Adams miniseries. We should do a podcast about it. And before I even finished talking, Jesse was like, yes, absolutely. Let's do it. Before we left dinner, I bought the domain yes. johnadamspodcast.com. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like like it, it was at risk of being snatched up by someone. Mm-hmm. So Ian and I are doing an episode by episode breakdown. Um, toward the end, after a few episodes, I'm going to start contacting some historians and people of note. Maybe we'll try to get Paul Giamatti on and shoot our shot. You know. Uh, I don't know. It's a, it, it's so far we've got a couple episodes in the in the can, in the ye old can, ye yeah, old can, yeah, and yeah. Uh, it's been very fun. It's not just about the revolutionary era. We're talking about a whole bunch of other things, as you know, pals do. As pals do, and yeah. I, and I feel like this is a service to to you, to my lovely girlfriend, to the various people we meet in our daily lives, where it's like, okay. Jesse and I can get this out of our system. <laughs> we don't have to like be like, so what do you think about the tariff situation back in the end of the 1800s? Did it, do you think it actually got finally resolved after Civil War? What, what's your thoughts? That's a very good point. Yeah. I, I will say I listened to half of the first episode mm-hmm. and because that's what I had time to listen to before you you got here. Very busy woman, Ian. And yep, very yep, busy woman. Yep. She totally would want to finish it otherwise. You just you just finished editing it. So it's not like it's been available <laughs> for me to listen to for a long time. I'm not like some of the guests who come on our show and they're like, I've never heard of this before. What is this show that I'm coming on? I actually listened to Wait a minute. Thomas Smith never did that. All right. So <laughs> I I really like it, and I do think it is more entertaining listening to you guys talk about HBO's John Adams than watching the HBO series John Adams. So I don't know if that will help or hurt that I, review. Yeah. But I think that's a ringing endorsement. I would take that. Yeah, that is not what I was yeah. expecting to hear. So for, for was... those for those of you out there who who like, oh, that sounds boring. That's it's not. Brittany just gave her thumbs up. I did. Yes, and as we all know. I am a very fun person, and I know what fun is. That's so true. I think well, you've proven that you know fun. Thank you. Let me say this though to your to your assertion that we'd get it out of our system. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is, is now we're going to be those insufferable people who want to like, hey, 
Uh, we're doing a podcast about history, so instead of talking about that's, history, that's we'll true. be talking about our podcast about where we history. talk about yeah, history. Yeah, no, that is that is sort of the tail eating itself. <laughs> it, it's and like I, I will say too, we're not just we like the show. I think one of us likes it more than the other, but we both like it. And like, but it's well, not who. Who likes it more than the other? I think you tend to like it a little. Oh, I, because I, I get swept away. You do get emotional. swept away. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know the scene, and uh, uh, spoiler alert, this comes in the second episode, but you know the scene where they walk up, George Washington walks up to the group, and he's got the black armband on, and he's talking about being in mourning for the Massachusetts who, who died in the... Are you asking me this question? Yeah, of course you don't remember. Anyway, this happens, <laughs> and I start talking about it, and, and I start getting emotional like a fucking ding-dong. Anyway, yes, I do lo- yeah, like yeah, the show. Yeah, no, and that's fine, and I like it too. Um, but it, it's not just like it. We're not just like only praising it. We're we're going through it both. We're I think we're critiquing it both as a piece of art and and as a piece of history, and sort of going from there. Yeah, so, pointing out certainly what they got wrong, but also maybe giving giving them leeway to make those choices because they're making a TV show. Yeah, and also just the politics behind the show, both like at the time it was made, but also the time that it is. Uh, dramatizing yeah yeah so a little bit in there for everyone i think yeah yeah so i'm go- excited for you guys i really am excited for you so guys. go check it out uh you can get it on apple podcast you can get it on spotify it's actually we're filming every episode so if you want to watch ian's handsome mug and whatever is on my face uh, it'll be on YouTube. We're going to be posting on Mondays at like 2 p.m. Yeah, it's my bad side. I'll just say that. I'm on the left. It's This, this is my much better side. I'm very happy to be on the right today. But you know what? We make it work. And then also, even though Monday at 2 is April Fool's Day, this is not a joke. Uh, yes. <laughs> it will be posted. So uh, thanks for joining us yeah, to talk about uh, the news and the headlines today. Um, always love being back in here. Do you guys have a nickname for the studio yet? Is it like the doubt? The, the no, no. Brittany's looking. At I mean, me you actually, seem really good at nicknames. I think you should come up with one. I mean, he but, just <laughs> he, Ian just provided the a wonderful segue. Right now, we're calling this the Uplift Standing Desk Podcast Studio. Oh. Today's episode brought to you by Uplift Standing Desk. Finding the right materials and tech to fit your working environment can be tough. With our podcast spaces, we went through a bunch of different desks and chairs while searching for a flexible setup that worked best for us. That setup, our Uplift Standing Desk. As the New York Times wire cutters standing desk pick for five years running, Uplift Desk doesn't just aim to improve your work, but your health as well. Studies show that using a standing desk can heighten your mood and focus, and moving more throughout the day lowers your risk of disease. We absolutely love our Uplift desk because we can go from sitting to standing height with one press of a button while prepping for and shooting the show. It's also super stable and comes with cable management accessories to help conceal all those wires. Customize your Uplift desk with over 100 desktop styles and hundreds of accessories. You'll get four free when you buy a desk. Elevate your work and your health. Go to upliftdesk.com slash I doubt it to get 5% off your first purchase when you use code I doubt it at checkout. Uplift Desk has 6,000 five-star Google reviews and counting, so we're not the only people singing their praises. And with a 15-year warranty, free shipping, free returns with free return shipping, you cannot lose if you try them out. Uplift your health and productivity. Just head to upliftdesk.com slash I doubt it or click the link in the description to score 5% off of your order when you use code I doubt it at checkout. Work better, live healthier with Uplift Desk. As always, we want to thank Uplift for sponsoring a portion of today's episode. Uh, The other thing we want to thank is uh, listeners who write in and call in and participate in this conversation, helping us move the conversation forward on an episode-by-episode basis. If you'd like to do that, you can call 657-464-7609. And of course, as always, you can email us, I doubt it, at dollamore.com. What do we got today, Brittany Page? We have a voicemail and an email, and we are going to start with a voicemail from Joe in Massachusetts. Hey, Brittany and Jesse. Uh, it's Joe, the urban progressive in Massachusetts. Um, so this is in response to, um, well, the latest podcast that I listen to. I'm just going in order. Um, a little, little ways back from where you all are. But uh, this is the one on Jordan Peterson. 
um, plus um, overturning of Roe and all that. So a lot to unpack, obviously. Podcasts are longer than a video. But um, just try to go through it quickly, a few points. Number one, um, you can't help but continue bringing up the wide disparity in um, white versus black female votes for Trump, especially in 2020, 55% to 8%. I mean, uh, are you down with the cause, or are you just, I'm pretty sure y'all marched back in 2016 with the hats and all that, right? The, the P hats, short for you know what. Um, okay. Are we not reaping the results of that vote at this point? Um, I have so much more to say, but moving on to Biden. 47 years to codify Roe. How long was Biden in the Senate? What would you know? 47 years. Pretty much since he started, that's when Roe started. Don't tell me, as a progressive, that you're going to bring back abortion rights. You had 47 years to codify it in the first place. There's so much more I could say, but that's the two major things, takeaways from your um, excellent commentary as always. So, uh, enjoy your weekend. Happy Easter. So, Joe, thanks for the call. Uh, first of all, about the disparity in um, voting percentages between black women and white women, you're absolutely correct. That is, uh, it's an alarming thing that so many white women and just white people in general vote for upholding white supremacy constantly, year after year, election after election. However, I don't know, I hear this a lot from people. It's not, Joe's not the first person I've heard say this about the white women who marched with the, with the pussy hats on after Trump's election. Those weren't Trump voters. Those women, I mean, I haven't seen this. It doesn't make any sense to me that those would be people who voted for Donald Trump and then took to the streets of Washington, D.C. or their particular city and marched in the Women's March in opposition to Don, that's that's that didn't happen. Um, as far as codifying Roe, everything he said is correct. Yeah, Democrats 100%. are being Democrats uh, like they often do with this spirit of trying to move the ball, but again, as slowly as they can, and we can get progress, but let's not rush it too far. Let's treat treat Republicans as though they're dealing with with uh, with us. Um, Re- dealing with reality on reality's terms and not being obstructionists, it's its a, a, a problem with the Democratic Party for sure. It's their one fucking job. Yeah. That's what they've been saying this whole time. I've been, I've been alive. We have to vote Democrats to get the court seat so we can we can codify Roe. We can get Roe sorted. Never did. He's absolutely right. 47 years. Never once uh, tried to do it. You know. And then now Biden is president. We have three Supreme Court justices who are illegitimate. Won't even think about stacking the court. Won't even think about doing anything. Like, like, like he's absolutely right to be outraged about it. Yeah. And, and now Democrats are running on it, saying like, oh, we need to get money. We need to vote for us because we're the ones who are going to protect Roe. And to their point, like, it is working a little bit, right? Like, that Republicans overreach is part of why Democrats did better on that midterm. It's going to be it's going to be a, a great thing for them to run on and not do anything about yeah, I mean, it's it's something that we've been talking about a lot, and it's difficult to balance the frustration with the Democrats in action on this issue. And even, you know, like we've talked about, Biden, you know, is himself as a person opposed to abortion. And so, you know, we, we've talked about that frustration as well. But we all know that things are going to be much worse for everyone if Donald Trump is elected. And so it does put everyone in kind of this difficult position where you're faced with Democrats who certainly are not doing enough 
and Republicans who will ruin all of our lives. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, that that's a very difficult position to be in. And related to white women, that's absolutely a problem that a significant population of a portion of white women feel comfortable voting for Donald Trump, knowing that if they vote to uphold white supremacy, that somehow they will be protected and saved. They're not going to be protected and saved. And um, they're, they're taking a gamble of, you know, voting to support white supremacy, hoping that, that, it, that it will pay off, and it's not going to. So, you know, I, I've done videos about white women voting for Republicans, and I, I try to talk about that issue a lot. Probably not going to move the needle um, <laughs> related to the, the specific people that Joe is talking about, but we can we can always try. Yeah, look, and here, here's the, the thing. The Democrats are lucky in this respect that what we face right now is an existential crisis for democracy and the continued existence of the country as we know it, if Donald Trump gets back into office, if Republicans gain control in really any way, they're going to they're gonna do everything they can to push forward their dangerous agenda. And it is, it's this isn't politics as usual. This isn't Obama versus McCain. This is something completely different. If you think that a 6-3 Supreme Court is a fucking nightmare, wait for a 7-2. Or wait for an 8-1 Supreme Court. They are champing at the bit to make that happen. And their wildest dreams of fascism will come true if indeed that does happen. So as, as feckless as Democrats are on policy um, initiation and getting it done so often, in my view, it just there's too much at stake to, to pull some protest vote or, you know, get so butt hurt and frustrated that you bow out of the process. So thanks for the call, Joe. We appreciate it very much. Um, on to an email. This is an email from Bex in Atlanta. Hey, Jesse and Brittany, I wanted to reach out to the show and share my thoughts on the importance of voting for Joe Biden over Trump this election. Mostly, I wanted to speak out about my frustrations when I hear you say how crucial it is that Biden win over Trump. Not because I disagree with you, not at all. I can't imagine the work it takes to be in your position during these historic election conversations. I think it's extremely important that people who are in the public space talking about politics, who have a platform the way you two do, advocate for this. I think it might just be as important to recognize how infuriating coping with that reality is, that we have to vote for the status quo so that our political reality doesn't become dystopian, as you said in episode 908. I would argue more dystopian since things feel pretty dystopian as is, but it's true. It can get worse. However, when I hear Biden speak about bringing back reproductive rights after Roe v. Wade, I am incensed. Biden and Democrats as a whole have had so long to prevent what happened on June 24th, 2022 from happening. And what Biden has been able to accomplish in his presidency has felt like way too little, way too late. Then I also consider things that have still managed to develop under his presidency, including the consequences of Roe v. Wade being overturned. The record skyrocketing of inflation and price gouging from companies with no accountability or even countermeasures like raising minimum wage. The genocide in Palestine supported by billions of American dollars sent to Israel to use as they see fit. Or even states actively making homelessness illegal, while people can barely pay their bills and prison labor is being used for profit by major corporations. Biden prioritizing his love for the idea of America more than the people who live in it has become clear in my eyes. While Trump is a capital F fascist, it feels more and more that Biden is fascist by association due to a pure or chosen denial of the trajectory of our country. Whether that is reality or my own perception, I will concede. I'm sure he's doing what he believes to be his best. And to be clear, I will be voting for him over Trump. It's just that when I think of voting for Biden again, I feel numb. I take no pride in it. The moment Biden is sworn in for a second term, my focus is going to be on how we get a valid third party candidate for the next election, or at least get rid of gerrymandering. The Electoral College, in state ranked choice voting, something, because I can't be asked to vote for the barest of bare minimums in lieu of an orange dictator many more times. As always, you both are amazing. Please change nothing about yourselves or the wonderful work you do. Your presence in this conversation is needed and very appreciated. Signed, Bex in Atlanta. Uh, thank you very much, Bex. Um, remarkable email. Yeah. Remarkable email on yeah. the on the heels of Joe's call. Um, 
I hope somebody has some connection to Joe Biden or the administration or somebody in power to be able to bring these topics to light, to bear, because you can only frustrate voters for so long before people start doing what I just talked about at the end of Joe's call and they start tuning out. They stop voting because they don't feel like it matters at all. Democrats, like both the caller and Bex has said here, have, have had power for, for many, many Congresses. The Congress is two years. Many Congresses, they've had the majority in both the House and the Senate, and they could have done something, whether it be on, on gun control, whether it be on, on Roe, whether it be on measures to abate poverty, whether it be about marriage equality. You know, we, we shouldn't be leaving it to the courts, especially these fucking courts, to make the decisions. Do your job in Congress, vote for the legislation, pass the legislation, send the legislation on to Joe Biden, and get things signed. Do your job. We cannot wait for a Supreme Court to, to just affirm it based on privacy or whatever. If you need to amend the Constitution, get off your ass and do it. Yeah, courts will never save us. I mean, that's just a liberal fantasy. They'll never, never save us. Uh, I, I love that email. I agree with basically everything Beck said. I, it is dystopian right now. Um, I sort of agree with him as well. Like, I'm not mad at Republicans because I'm used to, like, I expect them to be subhuman, right? Like, yeah. I expect that that's from them. I'm mad at Democrats because they, they fucking know better. And I think what he is, you two will probably disagree, but I, I agree with him, and I, I would change it slightly, that, like, when he is saying that Biden is fascist, like, a pro by, by proxy to Trump, I think he's right in the thing that he said, the, the genocide in Palestine right now. Like, yeah, he's not a fascist here, but we are exporting fascism abroad. And or at, at least supporting fascism abroad. Yeah. And well, I it, think that's inarguable. It, it, right. And it, to me, it's sort of a, it's a difference without a distinction, right? Like, yeah. and, and so, like, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm with, like, I, I prefer Biden to Trump. But, like, I, I don't, I, I personally, because I'm lucky I live in D.C., I'm probably not going to vote for Biden. Just because I don't need to, because we're not going to, it's, but if I lived in Virginia or any other state that mattered, I would vote for Biden. Yeah. And so I'm just lucky in that respect. The only thing I disagree with them, third party will never work. Constitution just is, we've just set it up in such a way. It's, it's going to be two party. All we've got are the Democrats. I, I'm with you. It's, it's dispiriting, but you, you can't, you can't go that route. So yeah, a lot of what Bex wrote here echoes what Joe said and what we've been hearing from a lot of listeners. And I think that, you know, these two pieces of communication weren't selected for their themes. It's like this just happens to be the theme of what we're hearing from a lot of people. And so it is scary to Jesse's point that like we're hoping people are listening and they're actually going to change. And one thing that I think about is the recent Supreme Court case that was argued about um, Mifepristone and Cori Bush Democratic Representative Cori Bush came forward and said, we need to repeal the Comstock Act. Yeah. The legislation that restricts the ability to send birth control in the mail. And it's like a law from like 1887 or something. Uh, 1873. Yeah. Pretty, it would have been close. the birth control in 1887. <laughs> well, it's not birth control. It's uh, certain things that are deemed oh, like, dangerous okay. can't be Got mailed, it. sent Got through it. the mail. Got it. And they're using that uh, uh, as a predicate Got it. for the law. It defined contraceptive as obscene and, ah, and illicit. Right. Yes, yeah, right. right. And so transporting that through the mail is is a problem. So uh, she's being forward thinking, Cori Bush. She's coming forward and saying, we need to act on this. We need to repeal the Comstock Act. And she's the only Democrat, I think, that has come forward to say that. So this is like a perfect example where the Democrats could come forward and they could take action on something and they could be forward looking and they could... <laughs> do something yeah. meaningful to protect Americans. And I mean, it remains to be seen whether more people are going to get on board with that. It doesn't seem controversial to get on board and say that, you know, before the court restricts our rights even further, that we should get out in front of this and do something about it, similar to how we didn't on Roe, you know. But, they, but hey, they had to ban TikTok. That, that, <laughs> that, 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 that needed to get through. I think we can all agree on Listen, that. He, the, the problem is, is that so many Americans have just been lulled into a sense of, well, there's nothing we can do. Oh, if only there was something Congress could do. The Congress has mighty power in our political system to, to write and pass laws that 
of their own device. They could just make shit up and pass laws as long as it's not contrary to the, the foundational principles of the Constitution outlined there. So they could do all kinds of things, and they're just... It's like they've abdicated their role in, in the war powers. They never declare war. It's just, oh, we'll just, we'll just shift our power, our constitutionally authorized, granted power of declaring war. And we'll just, we don't like to be politically unpopular. So we'll just give that to the president. It's, it's unconstitutional. Look, Do your job. And that's the thing for people like Bex, for people like Joe, for, for anyone, even Ian, I'm hearing, <laughs> for people who want to see a clear distinction between the, Democrat and Republican Party, this is the opportunity to do that. Because when the anti-abortion movement says that they want to weaponize the Comstock Act to further restrict access to abortion, to eliminate the ability to send medication abortion, the most common form that people use to have an abortion, when they want to eliminate that as an option, and a Democrat is coming forward saying, let's get out in front of this, let's repeal this, let's take action on this, that's important. We need to get out in front of this issue. We can't, you know, a year from now say we should have done this. The yeah. Democrats should have done this. They can do it now. Without a doubt. Hey, thank you for the voicemail, Joe, and for the email, Bex. We appreciate you very much. If you too would like to sound off, you want to take part in this conversation, 657-464-7609. And as always, of course, you can email a regular old-fashioned email or a voice memo from your smartphone to idoubtit at dollamore.com. Let's thank our Patreon supporters, Brittany Page. We love our Patreon supporters. They are the reason that we do what we do. So we want to give a shout out to our new Patreon supporters, KB. KB. Michelle E. Michelle E. Steve C. Steve C. David E. <laughs> Rhyme time McGee <laughs> with David E. And get ready for this. E.T. E.T. <laughs> And then we want to give a very special... Are you serious? They were all... That's It's just how it happened, yeah. <laughs> and then we want to give a very special so shout out to Dwayne F. Oh, no. Dwayne F. Dwayne F. Dwayne F is a long-time listener, long-time supporter of the show. And Dwayne F is a former high school classmate of mine. There you go. Oh. And a long-time supporter oh. of the show. And, yeah. and Dwayne F... Um, Edited the membership, increased their their Patreon membership. I, it looks like, and became an annual member. When you amazing, when you become an annual member, you get ten percent off, and you get a full year of access to benefits, like an ad free show where you don't have to hear any of the ads, like you just heard, and you you get our monthly bonus show, and you get to support other endeavors that we have going on, like Jesse's new podcast with Ian here, friend of the show, and it's a really relevant podcast, you know, and these times we, we need more things about a 15 year old show so yes good yeah well, i mean we're we're taking the lumps for we're, the public yeah for sure for yeah. sure so thank you again to our patreon supporters if you would like to join them you can go to patreon.com slash i doubt it podcast and support us there thank you all right moving on democracy facing down pessimistic politics with realistic optimism so I think it was on the previous episode where we talked about a Mr. Judd Blevins and Blevins <laughs> I, and Judd Blevins this cannot be real names. Hey, I'm sorry. Why are they all named this? My name's Judd Blevins and I love to march with my tiki torch in Charlottesville. And I'm a white nationalist who got elected to office in Oklahoma. Judd Blevins. In Enid, Oklahoma. <laughs> Enid, Oklahoma. It's not a real place. I refuse to believe these are real people. <laughs> this is just this is just made this is just NPCs. I refuse. So it's like a glitch in the matrix. Yeah, absolutely. He, they're Judd, just glitching into walls. Judd Blevins got elected. He is part Wait, what's of what's his name? Judd Blevins. Judd Blevins. <laughs> Judd Blevins got. Yeehaw! Did he unseat like, yeehaw! like yeah, te yeehaw! Tex McGee? Judd Blevins. So Judd Blevins got elected to the Enid uh, City Council. 
in what? Oklahoma. I'm a professional. I can work through this. Yeah, apparently. <laughs> and this is incredible. <laughs> he's been in that position for a year, <laughs> and it was exposed that he was at Charlottesville. He was holding a tiki torch. Mm -hmm. He is a part of Identity Europa. Ian oh, will be very friends. excited about yeah. this. And we played on the- My big... old friends, meaning they attacked you online. Yeah, yeah they it was like a three-day thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> We played on the previous episode an organization called Enid Social Justice Committee, and they are working on a recall effort. And I just want to remind you, because there were two women that were in this news package, Nancy Presnell and Connie Vickers, and I want to refresh your memory about who they are just briefly. If it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's a duck. And it, you're not calling name-calling if you call it a duck, and the same with a Nazi. <laughs> wow. And the same with a Nazi. She's not wrong. It's did someone, did someone push her back, push back on that? It's like, well, how could you call him a Nazi? He just happened to be at Charlottesville. Well, right. like, that's a great question, Ian, because he was denying that he was at Charlottesville, even though okay. there was a picture of him holding a tiki torch. And it's like, hmm, this looks like Judd Blevins. Um, I think this is Judd Blevins. He's like, I'm not going to admit to being at Charlottesville. But now he has admitted that he was at Charlottesville. And... His explanation, I think, is going to it's going to eliminate the concern that he's a Nazi. Because I felt it was important to protest the removal of statues of American soldiers, of American figures, that if they remove statues of men who, who fought in the Civil War, they'll move on to whoever they want. Defending, protecting, protesting against the removal of historical Americans is important to me. It's our history. It's our heritage. It's who we are. Blevins was later then asked to denounce white nationalism, and he responded that he couldn't denounce what he never was. So if, if Blevins keeps his seat and the recall fails, what do residents say that this means for their community? Yeah, talking to residents, they're, they're frankly embarrassed. They're, I think a lot of them are embarrassed that he was elected in the first place, and now they're pretty petrified that he will be uh, re-elected and what that will do to their city's reputation. Um, beyond that, talking to, to folks, they're worried about you know, how this city will go about attracting uh, businesses to come do business there in their town and their ongoing relationship with Vance Air Force Base, which is based there in Enid. So if someone were to look at this and just say, well, this is just one small city council in Oklahoma, like what is the larger connection? Is there a larger connection to the white nationalist movement in this country? Yeah, I talked with Pete uh, Sami, who is a uh, expert on white nationalism in the U.S., uh, started studying it after the Oklahoma City bombing, actually, in 1995. Um, and he said that white nationalists were emboldened after the election of Donald Trump in 2016, and that getting into local elections has been a goal of theirs. So the danger of having white supremacists holding uh, local office is that this is part of their agenda in terms of them being able to implement, execute very strategies, various plans as it relates to them wanting to create uh, a white ethno state, for example, which is, um, you know, obviously a larger plan on the horizon for them. But there are smaller steps along the way that need to happen. And having people hold a local office allow them to potentially achieve some of these smaller steps to the ultimate goal, really, which is, like I said, a white ethno state. Simi also went on to say that uh, beyond getting into local elections and, and winning them is uh, the, the threat of normalizing white supremacy is one of the bigger threats uh, facing this nation. So two things. First, very briefly, you don't need to speak to a fucking expert to know that white nationalists were emboldened by the election of Donald Trump in 2016. Secondly, for the, for the umpteenth time, for those in the back of the room, no statues of American soldiers were torn down or removed from public squares. These were Confederate traitors to the Republic. These were killers of Americans. They were seditionists. They were treason committers. Again, idiots. Uh, I liked... <laughs> he would have had a more effective argument if he was just like, well, I'm, I'm a t Tiki Torch enthusiast. That's why. I... <laughs> but the other thing I love, he's like, well, I can't denounce what I never was. It's like, well, no, I can do that all the time. I denounce plenty of things I never was. Like, you know, I, I denounce kamikaze pilots, you know, for instance. I don't think I was ever one of them. I denounce cancer. I'm not cancer. So this is yes. like a strange, this is a strange argument. I respect it, you know. 
he's really going for it, and I think that's cool. But I think the the bold jackassery. Yeah, it, it's just been mo- they model Donald. Like, it works for Trump. I'll yeah. just do the same bullshit. Well, and yeah, it is similar to Trump when he's like, I don't know anything about white supremacists. I don't know anything about uh, who is David who is the Nazi. David Duke. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and it's like okay, you you do know, and you're not denouncing it for a very specific reason. So again, this is a recall effort because the town of Enid, or at least a certain number of people in the town in Enid, do not want an actual Nazi to be on the city council. And so there's going to be an election on April 2nd next week between him and Republican Cheryl Patterson. Yes. So I, I, I'm assuming that she's not a Nazi and that they would prefer to have Judd Blevins not be in that position and have someone who's not a Nazi in that position. Let's go so. with soft white nationalism instead of the hard white nationalism. <laughs> that's the soft, the soft white end. I mean, apparently that's the only person that challenged him for the seat. Well, so, listen, uh, um, to, to put a fine point on this, and I, I don't want to be too aggressive or too bold, but uh, there are, in fact, not fine people on both sides. Nazis are fucking Nazis, and they need to be eradicated. Yes. Nazism and just the folks in general. Yes. All right. So we also want to talk about a story that we talked about. I don't, I don't know if we actually, I don't know if we covered this on the show, but... Some of you may remember this body cam footage that went viral because there was an officer who put someone, they, they patted this man down, they put him in the squad car, he was arrested, he was in handcuffs. All time this video. is the acorn thing, this right? Is so, yes, uh, yes. And I, I love this so much. And an acorn fell on the squad car and the cop mistakes it for gunfire and thinks that the person they just patted down and arrested and put into handcuffs in the back of the squad car is shooting at them. And so we're just going to refresh your memory because we're going to talk about what happened to the man who was in the back of the car where he is now. He's now sharing his story. But I I just want to refresh everyone's memory about what happened here. So this is going to include gunshots. It's going to be, you know, loud, you know, so just warning you about that. And at first, you're going to hear the body cam footage from the, the the male police officer who believes he was being assaulted by the acorn, and then it's gonna <laughs> it's gonna rapidly shift to without any kind of noise indicating that there's been a change to his female partner's body cam, where you're then going to hear a repeat of kind of the situation from her perspective, and it's just chaos and a nightmare and a perfect example of two people that should not be police officers. <laughs> Shots fired! 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 Shots do you know your tag number off the top of your head? Okay. Okay. Oh, it's okay. What? What? Wait, oh. yeah, right there? Jesse! Jesse, are you okay? Get in the house! Get in the house! Jesse! Get back, get back! Where is he? Where is he? in the car! Forty-three, give me traffic. Shots fired. Shots fired. I got a deputy down. No! 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 Jesse, how are you? Okay. No! No! Get back! Anybody to do anything, please? No! I might get my pass. Okay. 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 No! Get back! Get back! I'm not gonna tell you go. Get back! Get back! Get her! Get her and get her back now! No! Yeah! Do you see anything in my vest? What are you feeling? Did you feel anything? My legs went numb when it okay. hit me. Alright, alright. I don't know, my legs went numb for a second. I heard a pop come from. Go this way. Can you move? Yeah. I got you, I got you, bud. 
So the first thing is that the man in the back of the car is named Marquis Jackson. And the woman that you hear crying and screaming no is his girlfriend. And as I understand it, they had had a disagreement and that's what resulted in the cops being called. And and we're going to get to that in a second. But the cop who who heard the acorn fall and then immediately started firing off bullets. This is happening in a residential area. Yeah. This is, this is like in front of homes. And he's just firing wildly, indiscriminately. At least 22 times. Yeah. At I, least 22 times. I read the, the write-up of it, like describing like every part of the video. It's very funny because they talk about too when he drops to the ground and starts rolling around tactically, which I really enjoyed visually thinking about I, that. I think about it. How many cops are just going through their day ready to just unload a dump into their pants because they're so afraid yes, of everything going on around Of them. a literal nut falling on a, tr- on a car. And that's the thing. If you are in that situation, you shouldn't be in this job. Like this job is not for you. There's some jobs that are not for you. Like I know there's yeah. certain jobs that I would not be capable of doing. And I think a lot more people would be in a better position if we could be honest with ourselves about things that we can't do, what our limitations are. Yeah. And for this, what's his name? Jesse, Jesse Hernandez. For this officer, Jesse Hernandez, this is a limitation. He maybe shouldn't be a cop because he can't be in these high stress situations. Luckily, for the almost victim, Jesse Hernandez is such a fucking terrible cop yeah. that he didn't murder him. He yeah. didn't kill him. He fired 20 plus rounds wildly and indiscriminately into the air and no one was killed, especially the person he was aiming at. The amount of training they get for firearms versus being just given the firearms yeah. is like insanely low. So I tell this story a lot, but after, you know, after... Iraq, the second Iraq war, all these returning vets came and they were joining police forces. And everyone was kind of freaking out because they're like, oh, a lot of these guys have PTSD. Do we really want them to be walking around our neighborhoods with guns? And, you know, fair point. But turns out they actually were much better police officers than everyone else because they actually have some like fire discipline and like yeah. are taught like the just like as like sad as this is the the uh threshold to use their weapons is higher if you're deployed in iraq than if you're just some guy in a residential neighborhood so yeah Yeah, i mean and it's remarkable we talk about it a lot in like a a mental health context where policing in this country just looks differently than other countries right they are more trained in crisis intervention and how to de-escalate situations and that doesn't seem to be a priority for the police here and in this case now we have marquis jackson sharing his story, including a a lawsuit, given the emotional distress that was inflicted upon him when he almost was killed in this situation. This is the moment Okaloosa County Sheriff's Deputy Jesse Hernandez opened fire on his own patrol vehicle, believing he hadn't just been shot at, but hit. Police say Hernandez and his partner fired at least 22 rounds at the car. Shots fired, I got a deputy down. 24-year-old Marquis Jackson was handcuffed and sitting in the back. Do you hear the acorn hit the roof? Nah, I don't hear no acorn at all. Did you hear Officer Hernandez shout, I've been hit? I didn't hear none of that. You, so you didn't know anything that was going on outside? I didn't do nothing at all, so I'm like, why am I even here right now? So the next thing you know, all I hear is the gunshots. The first one I like hear like come through the glass. The second one was like across my face. I can like feel the wind. So that's when I ducked. What did you think was happening? They were trying to kill me. When somebody's shooting at you, that's all they could be trying to do is kill you. The incident played out as Deputy Jesse Hernandez and Sergeant Beth Roberts responded to a domestic dispute involving Jackson's girlfriend last November. Police said she claimed he stole her car, threatened her, and had a gun silencer. When Jackson arrived, he says he cooperated with officers. And I tell him, like, I don't got no side, whatever she wants to do, like, let's do it, because basically I knew, like, I didn't steal her car. I didn't do nothing wrong. They searched me, searched me a couple times then took me to the car. And right before they put me in the car, they searched me again. Do you have any weapons on you? No. Okay. What are you patted down for? Because you're getting patted down. In a statement, the sheriff says Jackson was only patted down once. Jackson claims it was at least twice. He wasn't hurt and was never charged with a crime. An internal investigation found Hernandez's actions violated policy. He resigned, but Roberts was cleared. Neither face criminal action. What are the images you see that you can't get out of your head? 
There's a whole lot of guns and glass falling, basically cop cars and sirens. I'm hearing noises all the time, stuff like that. Do you think you have PTSD? Most definitely. As an advocate, we want to make sure that we get him uh, the best help that he can. As a black man, I'm enraged. DeWitt Lacey represents Jackson and filed a lawsuit against the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office. Why are you enraged? The fear of this violent or angry black man being loose is what's been used to justify and rationalize the fear. And that is upsetting. That is angry. What do you hope the outcome is to all of this? Uh, accountability. Uh, we want them, and that is the law enforcement community, the sheriff's department, the county, to take this a little more seriously. To not pass this off as something that could be swept under the rug. This could have gone very differently. He could be dead, right? That is a, a likely outcome when you shoot that many bullets into a patrol vehicle and somebody's in there. For CBS Mornings, Jamie Ucas in Los Angeles. Once again, it's not enough that the guy quit his job. And no charges filed. How is what he did not criminal negligence at the very least? I, I mean, he's endangering. When you're a cop and you have immense powers, you know, again, I don't want to go back to the Spider-Man trope, but when you have th this kind of power and ability bestowed upon you, you've been deputized, you carry a gun, you're an armed agent, agent of the state, and you it just... What in the fiddle and fuck is going on in America? He's also a sheriff's deputy, and those guys are even like dumber and more insane. Like, have you guys thought of, like heard about all the stuff where they think they can arrest Joe Biden? Like somehow they are outside of the Constitution because yeah. of the, like, like of course that's who they hire. That's who, that's where you're gonna go. Unbelievable. I mean, I hope that they they didn't say anything about a lawsuit here, but I they did. Oh, did they say it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, get this guy his money. Get him everything. Get, get, pay this man. Yeah. I mean, as Teddy KGB would say. Absolutely. Pay yeah. that man his money. And uh, you don't know? You don't it, know, Brittany? Is that from um, the, go, po go ahead. the poker movie? Don't help her. Is that from the poker movie? Don't don't help her. <laughs> I've from, tried to get her to watch. Citizen Kane, I've tried to, <laughs> how dare, Citizen how dare Kane. you? I've tried to get her to watch Rounders. It's not. Maybe a, a dozen times. It's not. It's not going to work. Is that the poker movie? It is yes, the it's movie. the poker I movie. I knew what it was yeah. from. Yeah. I've basically watched it. So, Title of it is called The Poker Movie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's the guy who. Um, John Malkovich. Yes, great actor. He, they, he, they need to sue the municipality. They need to sue the county. They need to sue. The, the 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 individual Jesse Hernandez himself uh, even you know the female cop isn't named and and she's kind of getting let off the hook and she immediately went with this whole thing and joined him in yeah. the chorus of bullets yeah, that so was she being rained shot down also? On, yeah yes. like Christ. and she's like you know officer down shots fired i mean i i understand that you kind of have to trust what your fellow officer is saying but they patted him down twice they put him in the car handcuffed. Did you hear the back and forth between he and she? He's like, why am I being patted down? She goes, because you're being patted down. Yeah. That's the reason. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's prick shit, bro. That's prick shit. And it's no surprise that we have another story related to police misconduct here. And this is also kind of a follow-up because we recently talked about the case in Mississippi of Dexter Wade, who was hit and killed by a police SUV. And even though his mom had reported him missing, they buried him in a pauper's grave, which they had um, behind, a jail. behind the jail yeah. with yep. hundreds of unmarked graves and didn't notify his family. And we, we talked about that. It was over the course of several episodes. And now there's another case in Mississippi where they apparently a police officer hit a teenager with his car, killed him. And it doesn't seem like this is making headlines yet either. Well-known attorney Ben Crump says 17-year-old Kadarius Smith was run over by a Leland Police Department cruiser and later died in an accident that could become as big as a shooting of a Darian Murray. Kadarius' father, Patrick Smith, has made a direct inquiry about his son's death, but outside of that, 
Virtually nothing has been made public about the incident until today. This press release issued by Crump Law states Smith's death occurred in the early morning hours of Thursday, March 21st, when he was walking home with friends and the police cruiser began chasing him, according to a witness. The release also states, according to Smith's mother, he was run over from behind, leaving police cruiser tire marks on his back. At least three residents in the neighborhood tell the Delta News they were asleep during the time the incident reportedly took place and were not aware of what happened until the days after. Leland Police Chief Jimmy Myrick told the Delta News the Mississippi Bureau of Investigation is leading an investigation into this incident. None of the parties involved would speak with the Delta News on camera about this deadly incident. Attorney Crump's written statement reads, in part, This tragedy should have never happened and the officers involved must be held accountable. It is unconscionable that an officer would fatally run over a teenager who was running away from them. Crump is demanding the immediate termination of the officer and the release of unedited video footage of the incident. Crump says he and we all deserve answers as to how and why Smith was killed by an officer in what Crump calls, quote, such an inhumane way. Reporting in Leland, Jasmine Steverson, The Delta News. So I want to ask your opinions about this news package. Almost all of it comes from attorney Benjamin Crump. There, there's no statements from witnesses. There's no statements from the police department. I, I was left after wa- after listening to this thinking, why isn't there a statement from the police? Like, why is there no confirmation that this actually happened? I actually had to go looking for it. So the police have confirmed, but Benjamin Crump is accusing the authorities of trying to sweep this under the rug. And I mean... And then the media is sideways complicit in that sweeping under sure. the rug. 100%. Well, yeah, because I had to go and like, look up, did the cops confirm that this even happened? Like, I mean, this... at the very least, they need to say, we talked to the cops about it and they're not saying anything. Yeah, so Josh Bogan, the city attorney for Leland, Mississippi, said that the officer has been placed on leave. Oh, good. And that they have turned the investigation over to the Mississippi Highway Safety Patrol and the Mississippi Bureau Bureau of Investigation. So Two more cop organizations. Right. And so when Benjamin Crump is saying it seems like they're sweeping this under the rug, you know, it's tough to not believe that. Well, listen, even if it does get investigated, it's very likely because we look, we have past performance to view what future results will be like. And what happened in Seattle when that fucking cop killed that uh, University of Washington student, killing her, driving 70 miles an hour in a 35 mile an hour zone, that guy got let off. It's very likely what's going to happen here. And again, we need to hold our police to a higher standard because of the power we give them. This is why reformism doesn't work. Right, like they said, okay, we'll introduce body cams, that'll stop it. We'll introduce sensitivity training, diversity training, whatever. No, it doesn't matter so long as uh, we give them this amount of power, so long as they are above the law, which they literally are. They're never going to stop because it doesn't matter, to your point, right? They can be on as much film as you want. If they know they can get away with it, they're going to get away with it. Um, Qualified immunity. Qualified immunity. Which, what can be done? Well... What can be done is Congress can start passing some motherfucking laws to make this not a thing. <laughs> can, can I jump back to that briefly, actually? Because so what happens to me is since I'm neurotic, mm-hmm. I start thinking about all the things that I have previously said and how they might be wrong or where there might be. Anyway, good times in my head. And so <laughs> I started thinking about the intro conversation that we had about like Cori Bush and the Comstock Act. And I was thinking about people who were listening to it who maybe are not as far left and what they might be thinking. And I had the thought that I was actually thinking of one listener in particular who might be listening to that conversation and what they might email in to say. (laughs) I'm not going to name them, but they might know who they are. And, um, you know... We have so few listeners that Brittany catalogs (laughs) just... All of them in no, her mind. There's just someone who <laughs> there's someone who is hyper reasonable and whenever we are Should reasonable be in quotes? No, no, I mean, they're reasonable. But And when we are a little too missing something, they they come in with a very reasonable take. Anyway, whatever. So what I'm saying is they might be <laughs> listening to that and thinking, okay, yes, the Democrats should act. They should repeal the Comstock Act or they should act. They should do something about qualified immunity. But then they would say, well, if 
they don't have the majority, right? Okay. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah. It says, what can they do? Right. So all we have to do is keep voting for them. Is that basically how that argument <laughs> well, goes? I mean, well, uh, what's the argument but, against that? I mean, well, I mean that's that, fucking true. But I mean, that's a problem, right? Because at some point it's like, because they're... The, the, it's how are things going to ever change? You're like, okay, you don't like it is you have to keep voting for us. We're not going to do anything you like, but you have to keep voting for us because the other side is so insane. Well, luckily for the Democrats, fascism is right, the other choice right, right and now. It's, I mean, right I mean, now, it's, yeah. like I said, lucky for Democrats, it's not McCain versus Obama. Sure. It is Trump and Project 2025 and Stephen Miller and Steve Bannon yeah. and these fucking psychos. Yeah. That's what's waiting for us on the other side of the election. Not... Yeah, Grandpa Joe. My my response to him, other than to, I'll, I'll try to be like nice. Did I specify a gender? I no. think I just said the listener. Okay, but it, it felt very male coded. It could be a woman. Yeah, sure, I was for thinking sure, dude, but too. I was thinking dude. Just just when someone who's like, well, actually, that sounded very <laughs> dude to me. But um, but like, no, my argument would be like, okay, get hyper local then. If that's where that's where changes can actually be made. Like Congress, you're right. We're, kind of fucked but like you're not fucked in your city council you're not fucked in your yeah. local like school board whatever else if unless school- you live in Eden, oklahoma right but yes but even then maybe like yeah maybe then run against that the nazi yeah, yeah maybe yeah. not just yeah. have someone who who's a, a good republican who agrees with the nazi on literally everything but right. he's not a nazi it's not holding this if the Fucking uh, Chaya Raichik, whoever lives of TikTok, is becoming an Oklahoma school board member. Right? Maybe you should goddamn run library board. Yeah, library yeah, yeah, board. Yeah. Whatever. Like, yeah. like that's that's, that's what point. I would say. That's a good point. Back to the story about Leland, Mississippi, because oh, yeah. we did a quick little detour there. I do want to say that the city attorney has also said, and this is going to make Jesse go on a terror. I think so. Here we go. But the the city attorney for Leland, Mississippi, is challenging attorney Benjamin Crump's interpretation of the events. And he says, quote, there was a patrol vehicle that ran over the young man as to whether he ran over his... Fucking passive ass language. Man. Yeah, Go right. ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I know. Officer I know. involved. As to whether he ran over his back or what happened, that would depend on the investigation. And then he says... It was an accident. Well, I'm sorry, city attorney. Wouldn't that depend on the investigation? Right. Also, they should fire that car. How dare that That's... car run over a citizen? Fucking. Maybe the car has mental health issues. We should look into Maybe that. Maybe the car has PTSD. Yeah, 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 for sure. So we would love to know what you think about this story. 657-464-7609. Or you can send an email to idoubtit at dollamore.com. All right, moving on. The whole power structure's coming down. Number one show in the world right now. Let's talk about Donald Trump. A lot has been going on this week relative to his different criminal cases. Remember, there are 91 charges across four separate indictments against Donald Trump. Right now, the latest case is not civil, like the the, the Letitia James case, the fraud, the business fraud case was civil. This is criminal. This is Donald Trump's uh, payoff of Stormy Daniels uh, of $130,000 and then covering it up to keep her quiet so she wouldn't spoil his presidential run in 2016. Now, there has been a limited gag order put in place where he can't talk about court staff and a limited number of people involved in the case, but that has not stopped Donald Trump from going after the judge and the judge's daughter who has nothing to do with the case. The judge presiding over one of former President Trump's criminal cases is limiting some of what President Trump can say about the case as it is about to go to trial. The presumptive Republican nominee was issued a partial gag order on Tuesday. This is the case that centers around alleged hush money payments made back in 2016 to prevent an adult film star Stormy Daniels from going public about a supposed alleged sexual encounter that she had with Trump years prior. Trump has denied that encounter and has pleaded not guilty to the charges in that case. NBC News correspondent Garrett Haake covers the Trump campaign. He's been very busy for us. Garrett, um, how is the former president responding to this partial gag order? Yeah, Kate, not well, as you can probably imagine. He's been posting quite a bit about it on social media, including earlier today, in which he said that this was an attempt to take away his First Amendment rights and criticize the judge for putting the order in place, which is, of course, still allowed under this gag order. The judge, the elected DA, still fair game. It's folks like witnesses, potential jurors, and court staff about whom Mr. Trump is not supposed to speak. We will see if this gag order gets tested as this trial gets underway as scheduled in mid-April. So... This is leading to a situation where, and Ian, you laughed at that clip when they're when he's like, 
Trump is not reacting well to this. <laughs> I, I was laughing at that. And when they're like, yeah, our correspondent Garrett, who covers the Trump campaign, he's very busy. It's like, I bet Garrett's very busy. <laughs> yeah. So Trump is, again, to be expected, lashing out and rules apply differently to him than they do regular people. Because I will tell you, I've been in a courtroom a lot not because I have been in trouble because Former job. I, yeah, I worked, I worked <laughs> in a, um, I worked in a treatment court for years. And if you get mouthy with a judge, <laughs> that is not going to go well for you. But yeah. when it comes to Donald Trump, he can say almost whatever he wants about the judge and apparently about the judge's family. Although now they're trying to get clarification on that because who is it really that Donald Trump can't talk about, right? They said court officials, they named some people that, that are off limits, but Donald Trump is testing that. So now the prosecutors are seeking to get some clarification about who exactly is included in this gag order. And Trump's lawyers are saying that the prosecutors aren't just trying to get clarity on this. They're trying to expand the gag order and punish Donald Trump and take away his rights. Yeah, so Donald Trump's attorneys have just written to the judge saying that they think that the prosecutors are trying to expand on the gag order that was put in place earlier this week. The judge said that Trump couldn't make comments about uh, the potential witnesses in this case, the jury, court staff members, uh, members of the prosecution team and their family members. But he specifically said that it would not apply to the district attorney, Alvin Bragg. So the prosecutor's office pointing out to the judge that the day after after that gag order was put in place, Donald Trump made statements about the judge and his daughter, and they asked the court to clarify if this gag order applies to the judge's family members, the family members of the district attorney, or family members of anyone else associated in this case, including some of the witnesses or potential witnesses here. Um, Trump's attorneys are responding to that, saying that this appears to be an expansion or a request to expand the gag order. They're saying that Trump has interpreted the way that a lot of people have um, in you know, in the legal community, that it doesn't apply to the judge or his daughter. And if the judge is going to consider that, they want to be able to file legal briefs to argue against it. So uh, it's now before the judge, but, you know, the prosecutors immediately reacting to Trump's true social statements, where he was making statements about the judge's family members, and they're asking the court for some clarity, but Trump's team thinking that that is an overreach and an effort to expand this gag order, Wolf. Look, the media is is not doing a good job here. This isn't just about mentioning the daughter or talking about the daughter. This is about creating a very real threat to her life, endangering her safety, because there are unhinged Trump dedicated psychos out there who will do who will stop at nothing to please their dear leader, and that up to and including trying to overthrow the United States government, violently insurrecting uh, the Capitol. It, why are they giving Donald Trump the benefit of the doubt here that it's just talking about, just mentioning her on the true social? Ugh. What's he mentioning about her? Is it like that she's not a smoke show? Is that, is that where he's going? or is <laughs> you, you it? She looks nothing like Ivanka. Yeah, 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 you yeah, would yeah. think that's what it is. But it is, it's him. Are you really asking? I mean, Well, kind of. My brain is so like rotten that I just started here writing a Donald Trump tweet about this. <laughs> just, and I wish I could do, like, just talking about how like he had a per... He, Let's hear the, it. The, well, very... Can everyone, you do the voice? I can't do the voice. Can I you do I the could. arms? I could do the arms. Like, is it related to Ivanka? Yeah, it was well, like, got well, I was, it was like you know they're very nasty to me I, I had a perfect comment <laughs> this judge is very overrated his daughter is not a smoke show <laughs> and, you know that's that's you know i think well, it's that she is a democrat or has donated that's to right. democrats well, he's, or yeah. he's saying that she's tweeting pictures of him in jail but it's like from an account that's not even hers it's like I've heard, I don't know if this is true, but like Laura Loomer is behind. Incredible. It's just, it's all per just incredible. A, Perfect. A, 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 a cycle of, of, it's like human centipede with these fucking idiots. Yeah, but human centipede is like Chaucer by comparison, right? Like it's, <laughs> it's just like, it, just the dumbest people are all, yeah, they're all like mouth to asshole. It's very. Ugh. Well, listen, this is not out of out of uh, bounds for Donald Trump. This is the, why should we act like surprised by this? Just yesterday on Truth Social, he posted this video of these idiots who have their cars like painted with Donald Trump on them and uh, flags and flying their flags on the back. And the guy has a, a personalized plate. We're gonna play a video here, a clip here in a second. Um, 
It says Trump for U.S. personalized license plate or Trump for us. or It's just these people dedicate their lives. They give of their time. They give of their treasure for Donald Trump and, and to promote him. I am so and, happy you printed this out. <laughs> and they posted this video. He he, And this isn't a retruth. This isn't a repost. He posted this video of a truck with all of the idiot flags. And on the back tailgate is is a, a an image of Joe Biden hogtied, gagged in the back of the truck. So the video is just music. There's no speaking. It's just like, I think it's somber music actually, which is interesting because it's like this video of a monster truck. I think it's supposed to be like inspirational music. It oh, is, is, is that the vibe? That, That's that, not the vibe that I got. Yeah. <laughs> is it Phantom of the Opera? Because he's famously been coming out to Phantom of the Opera as his intro to yeah. events, but not from the show or from the Broadway musical. No, it's from the Gerard Butler movie. Okay. Yeah, just um, just want to make that clear. Yeah. I mean. It, I mean, look. This is this cost a lot of money to do to the truck. First of all, like these decals. Yes, I mean, yes. what's the estimate here? I t- 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 ten, well, the truck itself is probably about an eighty thousand dollars yeah, truck. Yeah, and then like probably at least ten grand, I would say, of custom stuff on. Also, here. here's what I love that they've got the the current sitting president of the United States gow- bound and gagged in the back, depicting his his kidnapping I- or harming him, and then on the side. On the side of the truck, it's a flag, and beneath it, it it's it's united we stand. <laughs> and it's got like spikes on the hubcaps. But but I'm he glad- wants us to be united, Ian. I'm so glad that you mentioned hogtied because this is so sexual. This is so <laughs> sadosexual, right? Like this is this guy is really working through something. And it, the, the other, I I'm knew just, that you were going to go there. Da, I mean, like, I look, knew. I mean, yes, you invite me on here. You know what I'm going to yeah, do. But also, yeah. like, all the thin blue line flags. Oh, yeah. This one says back the blue as they are, as they're depicting a crime of kidnapping and harming the sitting president of the, where the fuck is the, where, where, where's the secret service here? Well, I mean, I mean, it's filled with fascists who support Donald Trump. Right. Where they are. Right. The other thing too is I didn't know that it was called retruths on here. I'm really enjoying mm-hmm. this. I'm so glad you printed this out for me. I, I am going to be delighted by this for a you long time. You love how it looks. It looks exactly. It looks exactly like Twitter. It we're going to go does. over to Ian's. Yeah. We're going to go over to Ian's house later, and it's going to be framed on the wall. <laughs> D, it is crazy. I know. I've, I've been trying really hard not to take us off topic, and I think I've done a pretty good job. You but, have, yeah. But like stuff like this, like just really activates me, and I realize like how much Trump has invaded my brain and that I will just forever be thinking about like the way he talks, the things he posts, just like his like dementia is now like become my reality. (laughs) I'm going to forget what my dad sounds like, but I'm going to remember Trump tweeting about bad food restaurants and things like this. It's, it's just the reality he's created. Well, well, we have a gift for you though. Yeah. Because you know, every time he opens his mouth, you get a banger. Absolutely. And I think that he recently made an appearance on Fox and Friends and he started talking about where we are as a country and where well, let we- me guess, it's not a good place. It's it's bad. <laughs> oh, and okay. where where we're gonna end up if he's not elected. Okay. November 5th, that's election day. It's going to be November 5th. That is the most important period of time. It's the most important day in the history of our country. Our country's going bad, and it's going to be changed on November 5th. And if it's not changed, we're not going to have a country anymore. Hmm. Brian, uh, looks like the president was really balanced. He, he, a somber tone. Could there be more? Could there be more yearning for Donald Trump's ball bag to be just dangling around in between their That's lips? That's the and, balance we're talking about. It's oh, perfectly right. just left insane. And right. So the, the yearning for the grundle butter. They just, they want to, mm. Didn't like so, that. Didn't mm, like that. Mm, so, enjoy that one. That well, so both we, have, much? we have something that we play when things start going into this territory. The views and opinions of Jesse Dolamore are solely those of Jesse Dolamore and do not reflect the views and opinions of Brittany Page, who is a far superior person and much more measured and reasonable in her views and analysis. That's me. Brittany is a, a stated opponent of grundle butter and I Donald Trump's like ball those bag. Words. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't put them together. And then I wish it wouldn't then be like with Trump. Again, I think about his body too much but we've already oh, established interesting. that. Oh, interesting. Wow! 
<laughs> well, I mean, he famously doesn't take his shirt off. And so, like, Ever? that. Can you imagine that? I can't. That's what I mean. Like, it's because yeah, it's because he's already a very like womanly figure too. Like, there's just so much going on there that I. You I think don't... he has a womanly figure? You know what's weird? You've about never it is... seen his ass. The, the pictures <laughs> of his ass. It is <laughs> these fucking. I don't think about Trump's body as much as you. These I think is what we're they really believe he is like the prime specimen of alpha maleness. Like those Ben Garrison cartoons where he's yes. like, yeah, he's just like, he's got an eight pack. And uh... <laughs> do you do you love that debate moment then when like Marco Rubio talked about him having small hands and said that it means something else is small? And then at the debate, Donald Trump he's was like, like, no problem yeah, and here. He's like, I can assure you. And then he tried to say that there's a problem somewhere else. I can assure you there's no problem. And he like moved the microphone closer to his mouth. I, I mean, like, yes, Brittany. The answer is yes. I <laughs> love that moment. I loved every part of that. It really is a weird dichotomy between this comically stupid motherfucker. Yep. Who, who, who does pose existential threats to the safety and security of the nation from a military and, and, and national security standpoint, but also just the thriving of humanity in the country. It's, it's so, it's so fucking bizarre that this glitch in this simulation that we happen to be in, in the time. Yeah. We, the only thing we are lucky about is that he's fundamentally lazy and disinterested. Yeah, those the only who surround thing, him are not correct. That, Correct. That's the for sure. Problem. For that is sure. Scary because he he is not the one with the principles. He, no, he's he doesn't care about religion. Well, he, made, he, he doesn't made care American... about Christianity. He doesn't care about all this stuff. Brittany, what do you mean? He's selling Bibles. He's gotta love the Bible. He made America great again. I don't know what you're. Yeah, talking about. come on. I love the Bible. God, we gotta bring back God. Like God needs Donald Trump's <laughs> help bringing. If God is God, the creator of everything seen and unseen, he doesn't need fucking Donald Trump's help. God's very nice to me. Ugh. Always, always, always has uh, good things to say. We, we love him, folks. Don't we love God? <laughs> Here we go. All right. We're going to we're gonna solicit your communication, and then we're going to cut to asshole today to finish the show. 657-464-7609. Uh, and, of course, you can email a voice memo from your smartphone to I doubt it at dollamore.com. It's the asshole of today. Republicans who are currently scheming and twisting their mustache in a, in a, in a smoky cigar smoke filled room to try to overturn Biden offering some relief to the millions of individuals out there who have student loans and are being crushed financially by the interest on those loans. 11 Republican led states are suing the Biden administration to block a student loan repayment plan. More than 150,000 enrollees in the SAVE plan have had their balances erased. The lawsuit argues this is no different than the president's first attempt at student loan cancellation, which was struck down by the Supreme Court last year. Let's bring in CBS News White House reporter Bo Erickson. Hi there, Bo. So how is the SAVE plan different from the program that the high court rejected? Well, like most issues um, relating to student loans, the lawsuit today is highly technical. So we can break down some of the differences, though. And in relation to this current loan forgiveness plan by the Biden administration, which is called the SAVE plan, it uses a different legal basis than the plan that was struck down last year. Last year, the Biden administration tried to use an emergency authority, arguing that uh, people who have loans uh, student loans throughout the country, they needed some f f form of loan forgiveness after the COVID pandemic. Now, obviously, that argument was not uh, bought a wholesale by the Supreme Court, so they struck down that argument. But today, uh, the loan forgiveness program that is being used, the SAVE plan, it has a different structure to it. And the Biden administration is arguing that for the last 30, 40 years or so, the Department of Education has been tinkering with how uh, people who have student loans pay those back. And one issue in related to this is called income-driven uh, payment plans. And what the argument today is, is that the loan forgiveness actually comes by bringing some of those total costs down to zero for Americans who have a low income. It is only uh, canceled, these loans are only canceled for low 
uh, income earners throughout the country. Now, obviously, these Republican attorneys general, they do not agree with the whole political elements of that, but they also say on the legal basis of that, it is changing these student loans and making them federal grants, which are two different aspects over at the Department of Education. That is their argument, and that is what the federal court system will have to look at as this lawsuit moves forward. Yeah, fuck them. Um, <laughs> yes. I mean, there's no, there's no, there's nothing else to say. I mean, like new drop just arrived on the show. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, like this is why you can't do means testing for this shit. This is why you should just eliminate student debt because then you allow these fucking vampires to come and, and challenge. And to bring us full circle, a little callback from earlier. We love callbacks. I wonder who could do this. Who yeah, has yeah. the power to pass legislation and send it to the desk of the president of the United States? Ha ho! It's Congress. Or the president could just do it himself. Well, he tried. He, well, no, he didn't try. He, he relied on emergency powers. He could say, I'm the chief executive. This is an executive office office i'm forgiving debt and then the supreme court goes back and says you can't do that just be like try to stop me enforce it right i mean what, 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 like we, we've done this in the past i'm not quite there um and i i don't like when people say well if we do that then they'll be able to do that but we're getting to the point where they're going to fucking do it anyway we might as well just ignore the supreme court like fuck you who cares what you say you yes. are an illegitimate court yes you were appointed by someone who didn't get the popular vote yep um and, and then the senate doesn't even represent republicans in the senate don't even represent the majority of america Two of you have been credibly accused of sexual assault yeah like, i mean like this is just like this is ridiculous well and i think it's funny in that news package where sometimes republicans will say that student loans are for rich people which is strange <laughs> And bizarre. you yeah. even heard it here where this specific iteration of student loan forgiveness is targeting low income earners. And then the reporter said something strange after he mentioned that. He said that the Republicans do not agree with the whole political elements I, of that. I'm so glad you caught that. And I'm yeah. like, what? What does that mean? Yeah. What What does that mean that they don't agree with the political elements? Yeah. And then he's like, and then there's a legal argument for it. It's like, okay, well, you gave away the game. They don't actually believe any of this shit. Well, it's, it's also it's it's states Republican led states attorneys general yep. whose job is not politics. Their job is to enforce the law. States so, law. Yeah. Not so, federal fucking law. What is this shit? It, it, it's always that Democrats get cases rejected because they don't have standing. I never hear about a Republican who's bringing nope. a case and the court's going, sorry, you just don't have standing yep. in this. You're gonna, We're going to throw this out. Just never. They always get what they want. And Democrats and liberals trying to make people's lives fucking better. How many times have you heard a story about someone who has $70,000 in student loan debts and they paid $500 a year or a month for 10 years and they still owe $60,000 or even sometimes the same amount or more than they started with. One of my favorite haters, that's a great point, Jesse, and I don't want to move directly no, into no. this funny go, story, go, but go. one of my favorite haters made like TikTok videos and tagged me in them. And they were Normal. just like, they were of like <laughs> stills of, of me doing my YouTube videos, but zoomed in on my face. And then it had like a thought bubble and it said, um, you know, $80,000 in student loans and I'm doing YouTube, what am I doing with my life? And I loved it because I'm like, how did he get access to my internal Yeah, model? right, right, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> how does he know like the exact amount basically? Yeah, like yeah. what's going on here? I'm scared. Yeah. But you know, shout out to that hater because that was, that was nice. But yeah, it's true that low income earners, that's who this was targeting. And still they ra raise up and they're like, no, we can't have this. We can't have poor people being in a better position financially in yeah. this country. We can't give them anything. We poor want their people, lives to Brittany, be terrible. Have had it too good for too long in America. Poor people don't vote. They don't vote for them. So who cares? No political cost to it. So Ugh. fuck them. Except for the poor people's campaign is uniting poor people and working class people and trying to change that, Ian. Yeah, which yeah. Well, this, this will bring us full circle. We'll end the show there uh, to something you said earlier about getting involved in local mm -hmm. local issues. You don't have to get involved at the federal level. You don't have to uh, knock on doors for some somebody running for Congress. You can absolutely get involved with an organization like uh, the poor, poor People's Campaign. We went out uh, last summer or the summer before. 
somewhere. They, it all blurs there. together when you when you get cancer, and then is it pre-cancer or is it post-cancer? We, we don't know. Wait, you had cancer? <laughs> Let me tell you about <laughs> a little story. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. No, get involved in the poor people's campaign. It, it, get involved at, at the local level. Get involved in some activist organization, and and move the needle. If if a thousand people listening to this were to get involved, it would it would absolutely be transformative at the lo local level. Uh, just do it. Anyway, we love and appreciate you, whether you get involved or not, although we love you more if you get involved. And don't forget to get involved with the HBO's John oh, Adams. look at you that. Thank a revolutionary you. review with Jesse Dollimore and Ian Brinksman. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> crushed it no I, notes i uh am very proud of you guys i really am Aww. you guys are doing a great thing it's very entertaining again i listened to half the first episode loved it can't vouch for the rest but you know the first half was good <laughs> and i'm excited to see where it goes us too it's going to be a good time we would invite your conversation, uh, your, your participation in this conversation, rather, 657-464-7609. Of course, you can email a voice memo from your smartphone to idoubtit at dollamore.com. Uh, Ian, any parting thoughts since uh, this is uh, not a, a, a regular occurrence that you're here with us? No, no parting thoughts. Thank you very All right, much. Never you mind. Think, uh, okay. Brittany? No. All right. Go ahead. No, no, no. Uh, thank you for inviting me back on. Hopefully, I behave myself uh, sufficiently. Uh, Brittany, I apologize that I am kind of your enemy now. I understand that. I, I promise you, I will not be going to Montreal with Jesse in January. That is <laughs> still a role that you can take. Okay, um, good. But otherwise, mainly because you're you're. Uh, your soft boy. The weak constitution <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. for the cold weather. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I get the vapors. Well, I, right. I will be keeping your decorations up on my shelf. Okay. For I wonder that time if people being. who watch on YouTube were like, what the hell's who going on? Yeah. Like, yeah, I with Thomas Jefferson, John Adams letters book. It's not mine, but soon my stuff will be back and Ian will be gone. So <laughs> that's <laughs> ominous, but fair. All right. We love and appreciate you very much. Uh, consider helping support this show, keeping the lights on, helping us move the conversation forward on an episode by episode basis. You can go to patreon.com slash I doubt it podcast for two measly dollars a month. You can help support this work and we would appreciate you for it. Uh, we'll see you next time for Brittany Page, Ian Brinksman, I'm Jesse Dollamore, and this has been I Doubt.